Okay, welcome to the 2013 Latour Eichenwald Forum on HIM Leadership and Innovation. My name is Ryan Sandifer and I'm the Chair of the Department of Health Informatics and Information Management. And on behalf of the College of St. Scholastica, the School of Health Science, and the HIM Department, I'd like to thank all of those who are in attendance on the Duluth campus, as well as all of our friends who are viewing the event via online streaming tonight. Before we get started, I want to thank a few individuals for their support of tonight's event. First, I'd like to thank all of you who have donated to the Tour Eichenwald Forum Endowment. Uh, there has been an outpouring of generosity over the past year, uh, but we are still fundraising to complete our endowment. Uh, if you'd like to donate to the fund, there are envelopes in the foyer, or you can just reach uh, Nancy uh, Krigo or myself after the event at any time. I'd also like to thank uh, President Larry Goodwin uh, in the Office of the President and Lindsay Lottie and the GEO Department for providing support for tonight's reception. I know the food and drink uh, were appreciated by, by all. And I'd like to thank Sarah Libin and Cheryl Zupek for the marketing support. They definitely got the word out about the event. I'd like to thank Scott Pike and the Mitchell staff for use of the space and the technology support for the face-to-face -face and the streaming components for the event. And I'd like to thank Nancy Krigo and all of the other college and department faculty and staff who have worked hard to organize and coordinate this event. So will you please help me in uh, applauding their efforts. I'm very excited about this event tonight, uh, and it, as it is an opportunity for us to collectively look back at the history of the department and honor two of its finest professionals, Kathy Latour and Shirley Eichenwald Mackey. And also look forward at the challenges and the opportunities for the profession through the eyes of an individual who exemplifies Kathy and Shirley's innovative approach to leadership and their commitment to the profession. Tonight we are fortunate to have Patty Sheridan with us to offer her thoughts, and I'm extremely excited for her presentation. But before we move on to Patty's presentation, we would like to honor two other greats in the profession, Margaret Amadiakal, Margaret A., and Dr. Marita Johns. These, yeah. These two extraordinary women have devoted their careers to HIM education and practice. They have taught in academic programs. They have published countless books, articles, and chapters. They've served on boards of a number of national professional associations, and on and on and on. I have seen their vita for accreditation purposes, and it is they are long indeed. So um, they are extraordinary academics and HIM professionals, and they are also kind and sincere individuals as well as mentors to many, many students. Margaret and Marita have taught in the College of St. Scholastica's Masters of Health Information Management program from its inception. They are classified as visiting professors in the program, which means they have taken on this commitment in addition to their other professional work, which I can attest to is extremely significant. Their commitment to industry involvement, commitment to CSS students and the program, and the future of the profession is what makes their courses so spectacular. They truly represent the Benedictine value of love of learning. When most people think of St. Scholastica, it conjures up the image of the great tower hall you know, that we are attached to right now, and it's blue stone. In 1906, when Mother Scholastica cursed was envisioning the future of the tower hall, she said, my dream is that someday there will rise upon these grounds fine buildings like the great Benedictine abbeys. They will be built of stone. Within their walls, higher education will flourish. The stone walls of CSS have become symbolic of the high quality of teaching that is demonstrated by faculty such as Margaret and Marita. It is with instruction and mentoring like theirs that our HIM alumni have the solid foundation to lead the profession. I'd like to now ask Kathy and Shirley to join me on the stage. On behalf of the department and the college, we would like to present Margaret and Marita with these inscribed stones that are from the walls of the College of St. Scholastica. The stones represent our gratitude for being a cornerstone of the HIM program. 
So please come up and receive your stones. Okay. So finally, we have also created an award in Margaret and Marie Designer. These two women have devoted their careers to academics, research, and scholarship, and in honor of their commitment, we have created the Margaret Amadiakal and Marita Johns Graduate HIM Research Award. The award will be given annually to the HIM graduate student whose research poster best exemplifies research excellence and innovation contribution to the HIM profession, demonstration of creativity, and incorporation of Benedictine values. The winner of the first annual Margaret Amadiakal and Marita Johns Graduate Research Award goes to Philip McCann. I should have said this, but uh, Phil's project's title was Care Coordination and Pragmatic Health Information Exchange. And essentially, Phil conducted uh, a research project that was focused on utilizing uh, the direct protocol for health information exchange with six behavioral health facilities. And he developed six different use cases um, that incorporates best practices across them. That was an outstanding piece of work and uh, fantastic job. Congratulations. With that, I would like to turn it over to the President of the College of St. Scholastica, Dr. Larry Goodwin. Well, good evening and welcome to the college, to the campus. For those of you for whom this may be your first visit to Duluth, and you're a little taken aback. Uh, it, it helps, I think, if you just say to yourself, it's, it's April 63rd. <laughs> it's my great pleasure to introduce Patty Thierry Sheridan as the keynote speaker of this year's Latour Eichenwald Forum on HIM Leadership and Innovation. Uh, the purpose of the forum is to honor the legacy of two pioneers in the HIM field, and I think we know Kathy and Shirley, uh, to honor their legacy through a keynote address by an individual who exemplifies their leadership qualities. And Patty definitely meets that requirement. Patty earned her B.S. in Medical Record Administration from Keene College in New Jersey and her M.B.A. from Baruch College, the City University of New York. She is the immediate past president and chair of the American Health Information Management Association Board of Directors. She has held volunteer roles in state and national HIM organizations, including president of New York Health Information Management Association and participation in AHIMA's 
Organizational Structure Task Force, eHealth Task Force, and eHIM work groups. Patty is committed to supporting HIM academic education and is currently a member of the Resurrection University Board of Directors for the College of Nursing and the College of Allied Health. Patty is also the president of Care Communications, Inc., a national health information management consulting company based in Chicago. Patty began her career as a coder, which she credits with opening many doors throughout her career. She has held various HIM roles in acute care settings, as well as senior executive roles at AHIMA. She co-authors the column Hands-On Help, which appears monthly in the online magazine Advance for Health Information Professionals, and is a frequent speaker on the topics of health information management, leadership, and leading transformational change. Patty's personal vision is to be a calm presence, always to dream big, and to live a happy and purposeful life. That's a great vision. Please join me in welcoming Patty Thierry Sheridan. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, my, heart, my heart is pounding because I can't believe my name was said in the same time with Kathy and Shirley. What a joy, what an honor. When I first came to AHIMA, Shirley was working there as the, the head of the education division, and Kathy was coming on as a director maybe six months after I was there. And for those who know me at that time period, back you have a lot of stories to tell, but that would be in the, um, let me move this down just a little bit, I think, around in the um, early 90s. I was green. I mean, I was really pretty green uh, in my early 30s at that time. And uh, both Shirley and Kathy just took me by the hand and said, we're going to figure it out together, and we did. So what an honor to be here. Marita, she and I got a chance to work together, but probably um, my most memorable experience and memories of Marita is when she was president of AHIMA and uh, very much a role model for me and always reminding us to um, put the work in front of us, get the issues out on the table. We called at that time, get the moose. She gave us all moose ornaments. So every year when I see that moose ornament come out of my bag, it's uh, with great joy. And of course, Margaret A. started the computerized, well, with others, but started com the CPRI, Computerized Patient Record Institute. And 20 years later, look, look where we are. So I think a tremendous movement um, that AHIMA supported and, and helped to fund that Margaret helped to create. So I have a lot of history with some of the people we're honoring today and it's really humbling uh, to be here. So I hope I do a good job for you guys. <laughs> I really do. Uh, and Kathy, I hope to share creme brulee. That was our big, our big thing, right? I was um, here, I guess, three years ago. I had the opportunity as part of AHIMA's Research Institute, and AHIMA is the American Health Information Management Association. Um, Shirley and Kathy were kind enough to open up St. Scholastica to AHIMA to have students who are interested, or practitioners who are practitioners and educators who are interested in performing research come here and learn how to do that. So that was my first time here, and I was telling Larry it was um, such a wonderful experience. It was very retreat-like for me. It's been a long time since I stayed in a dorm. Uh, so that in itself was, and I had a roommate, <laughs> so that was a great experience. Um, but I learned quite a bit there, and my, my project, my research project was on leadership, on health information management leadership. Uh, so in many ways, I got started here. I worked with your IRB. Um, I made good friends with the IRB. I think it was about a four-month process to get my leadership study um, approved, but it was a really, really good learning, uh, very good learning experience for me. And probably the last uh, story I want um, to share with you about St. Scholastica was the joy I had when I took a walk through the campus with uh, some other colleagues, and we were in the cemetery, and there we saw the headstone for Sister EHR. So <laughs> I thought that was pretty cool, <laughs> and I knew I had arrived. <laughs> um, so I... So St. Scholastica, well, I'm not an alum. Can you all hear me okay? I hear a lot of feedback, but we're good. I'm not an alum, but you're in my heart, and certainly the, the leadership here 
um, has, uh, for, for all intents and purposes, raised me in, in many ways. So, so thank you to that. And then I met some new leaders, uh, new up-and-coming leaders are in the audience today, people that are on the AHIMA ballot, and people that are doing really good work in your state. So kudos to all of you. We know St. Scholastica graduates um, the top, top in the profession. So my subject um, today, the conversation I'd like to have with you is on leadership, um, particularly adaptive leadership, which is something I've been studying now for several years. I had the opportunity to spend eight days at Harvard about four weeks ago, immersed in the topic of adaptive leadership. So it's kind of all swirling around in my head, um, which is not really a good thing for all of you, because <laughs> that could mean that I could talk out loud, think out loud for hours, but I promise you I won't do that. There are two things that I uh, hope you take away from um, our brief time together. The first is that you look at leadership a little bit differently than you did um, before you came in the room. So when you leave, you're thinking about leadership a little bit differently perhaps through another lens, and that you process that for several days after today and think about um, the things that I'm sharing with you. And the second is that when you get up in the morning, excited and ready to conquer the day, that you ask yourself a question. What do I need to do today to be a responsible HIM leader? Or what do I need to do today to be a responsible president? of the College of St. Scholastica, or, or where's Ron, a responsible dean, or a responsible whatever in your walk of life. That question for me has been really grounding every morning. I can't say I always have a very good answer. <laughs> Sometimes I don't know. Um, but I think it's been very important. And I also think it's very congruent to the mission of the college um, because you talk about responsibility, and certainly it's congruent with the Benedictine values. So I think being a responsible citizen um, is very much in keeping with the topics of leadership. But before I dive into leadership, let me just talk a little bit about what's going on in the industry. Um, some of you have asked me, are you going to talk about what's going on in HIM? So I don't want to disappoint, but I don't want to go on too much about it because I, I just have spent um, an amazing day with the master's, um, or afternoon with the master's students, and all of you taught me so much about HIM today. So I think we find ourselves in a very reciprocal mentoring <laughs> situation because I learned a lot from all of you. But this word creative destruction comes from um, economic theory. It's really a term of, uh, of, uh, around innovation and how uh, particular jobs or um, industries really are forced to change. I think about the farming industry, which looks really different than it did back in the 1800s to today. Think about the music industry, you know, total transformation. Who would have thought we would be listening uh, and, and working with that kind of um, music now today. And then I think about just community and how we are all connecting through social media, all very different. And of course now healthcare is going through its own um, destructive or creative destruction. I wanted to just point out the HIM career map. I don't know if this is something that uh, you've happened across. And uh, while I can't go into all of the little dots, they represent some of the uh, HIM roles, some emerging, some existing. So if you haven't had a chance yet to go to HI careers, I um, suggest that you take a look at this. And what's exciting is it just um, shows the different opportunities and different or career pathways. But probably most important to me is I get this question uh, asked of me all the time because I'm always talking about the new opportunities in HIM. And people say, well, but Patty, where are the jobs? <laughs> I can't find these jobs that you keep talking about. And really, you're not talking about them specifically enough, specific enough that I can even understand what you're talking about. And they make a good point. And I think that's because we're creating the jobs. You're teaching, those of you that are faculty, you're teaching to jobs that aren't even available to us yet. So I think you have such a, uh, an opportunity to go out and understand the, the needs of your community and to create the jobs. That is what the music industry did, that's what the farming industry did, and other industries who have had complete upheaval. So don't get discouraged if you're, you're um, 
learning, you're knee deep in learning about informatics and you're looking for informatics job postings, you're probably not going to find them. Um, but they're out there for you to create. And that's probably the best um, that I can give to you right now. And it, really your relationships that you build along the way, your ability to, to connect dots will become very important. But we do know that new roles are absolutely being uh, um, replaced by our current, current roles. I think Linda Kloss did such a nice job last year when she spoke at, um, the, uh, uh, here, and she talked about the different eras. And I really like that she labeled this era the, um, uh, the era of data data science or the sciences around data. I think that there's something to that and we're struggling with what do we call this era? We've kind of gone from record management uh, into where we are today where it's all about the data. Uh, so I think that that's probably a good construct for us to work with and it's going to require us to really uh, become standard setters, setters. Some of the posters that you all uh, did have uh, um, implications of the importance of setting standards and many of you talked about data quality. Well that has to come not only from AHIMA, yes of course um, with my AHIMA hat on, AHIMA has a tremendous responsibility to create alliances and pathways for standards, but all of you can do that in the organizations that you serve. As I travel around the country last year um, in particular, and also this year, I come across so many people that are innovative. And what I'm reminded of as I talk to them and say, well, how is it that you're so innovative? You don't necessarily um, work in an innovative organization, yet people are doing pockets of really neat innovation. And you know, one person shared with me, well, I kind of liken, liken it to when I was a child and um, I learned how to play, or <laughs> we just played. And the skills of playing as a child are very similar to innovation, um, to be creative, to have a really good imagination, and problem-solving skills. So I thought, well, there is something to that. As we grow up and kind of go through our lives, we forget about play, and we forget about some of the important childhood lessons. I just share this with you, because you're saying, why is she sharing this? It's because innovation is inside all of us. We have these basic skills, and we're going to be faced now with people um, in authority positions, like myself or like Larry, who may not exactly know the way. We have a sense of the way. And we're going to need everybody, <laughs> everybody helping to contribute to where, um, what's the next direction, where do we need to go next. One really neat thing that I'm excited about is this new movement called quantitative self. Has anyone heard of it? I see a nodding head. Well, I um, recently purchased a Fitbit. Does anyone know what a Fitbit is? So there's still only one nodding head. <laughs> All right, well, personal analytics um, is the, the interest in knowing a little bit more about um, your fitness and kind of uh, some aids to get you moving. So this little Fitbit has told me how many how many steps I've taken. I've taken over 5,000 today, probably thanks to Ryan, because you took me through some securitist passages. <laughs> I walked a little over two miles. I burned um, 1,700 calories, so that's good. And I have a little flower on here that grows as I start to meet my goals. Well, what's the big deal about this? <laughs> I like that I watch the flower. It's good feedback. <laughs> All of these wearable devices, um, you're seeing more and more. You see a Nike bracelet uh, and people kind of the fuel that you're, you're expending for the day. Um, people are just interested in moving a little more and being more fit and getting some feedback about that. But what I can do every day is I sync with my smartphone. I see little graphs. I also um, uh, sleep with my my Fitbit so I can get information on my sleeping patterns, how many times I wake up at night and how restful my sleep is. And I um, upload that uh, sync with my computer or my smartphone 
And I'm seeing that people, I'm talking to people who are doing this all over the country now. And they're experimenting with what does this data mean about me and how can it help me be more healthy. I'm also seeing the data being shared with their friends. So now people are having contests. They're looking at how Shirley did with her Fitbit data that day and if she's meeting her stated goals, et cetera. And some of this data is now also being uploaded and shared with um, uh, social media communities. And then we're seeing uh, discussion, I don't think I've actually seen it personally, but some personal data being integrated with the EHR and then sharing that across a health system and also being used for informal epidemiology. So it's just kind of interesting how personal analytics is starting to come into play as people care a little bit more about their fitness. And just um, in general, using social media tools or just using these kind of devices. I know my parents are spread across the country and I worry about them, I'm the only child. And how do I help my 80-year-old dad make sure he exercises and boy, I wish he'd wear a Fitbit and he'd sync that data up to his dashboard so I could see it <laughs> and I might know how he's doing. Um, or my grandmother when she was alive, if I could have monitored her diabetes perhaps better. Maybe I could have been uh, able to do more intervention as her health deteriorated over time. At any rate, I think uh, watching how these health devices change um, the nature of health information, bring it to the patient and really involve patients will be really interesting to watch. To look at how um, one group is responding to the creative destruction, we can look uh, to what Ahima's um, thinking and the direction that Ahima wants to go. I want to really get onto the topic of leadership, so the only thing I'm going to say um, are two things. One, uh, the strategic plan for the next three years was released in April, so I do encourage you uh, to read it. It's on the AHIMA website. And the next thing is just to say that the strategic plan is organized around five very important strategic challenges. Uh, informatics, really shoring up um, the talent, the workforce within HIM, the skill sets to be able to turn uh, data into health intelligence. Um, the report goes into some ideas of how HIM professionals can do that uh, and what AHIMA itself needs to do. Uh, challenges around leadership, in particular updating curriculum and um, having uh, opportunities for graduate degrees, study in HIM and informatics, and then just leadership in general, information governance, I think so many posters were about data governance and information governance, innovation we talked about, and then of course the public good, um, really cu um, customer or consumer facing initiatives that will be really important from helping people manage their Fitbits, uploading their data, understanding their data, connecting it with their EHR, and then all the things that we already do already. I suspect that many of you are um, the go-to person in your own homes for uh, things related to health care, for bills. I talked to some of you earlier today and uh, you shared some stories with me about how you help your family navigate the health care system or navigate their bills. So let me go ahead and move on uh, to get to the topics that I also love, leadership. Let me see how I'm doing on time as well. I promised Suzanne, Susan, that I would do that. <laughs> All right, what I'd like for you to do is to close your eyes for just a moment. I'd like you to think about an aspiration that you have, something really important to you, something really important to a community of people, such as your family, maybe your church, maybe your workplace some aspiration that you have for a community of human beings. Now think about the current reality. So you've got the current reality, your aspiration for this community. Now think about the gap between your reality and your aspiration. Okay, go ahead and open your eyes. What I'd like for you to do in the next 25 minutes or so and after when you leave 
is to be thinking about that gap because that gap presents a leadership opportunity for you, presents an opportunity over time to start working on what you can do to close that gap. I'm not talking about doing a gap analysis on what's working, what's not, what's my strengths or weaknesses. It's just here's an aspiration for a group of people working together. It may be improving the use of the copy-paste cloning function in my organization, or it could be something related to your family. It doesn't have to be this huge, big, hairy, audacious goal, but it has to be a, um, a work effort, a problem you're trying to advance within community, within your family. And to be thinking about how you can close that gap. The title of this talk is Learning, or sorry, yeah, there we go. Lead, learning to lead, yeah. Learning to lead adaptively. Not just surviving, but thriving. And that important uh, work, I think, because it's not enough just to survive, and healthcare is going through too many changes, so if we're kind of on autopilot doing our best to survive, first of all, it's very hard. Uh, we'll burn out, because survival mode is not something we can stay in for very long. Um, but this concept of thriving, I, I take very much from the natural sciences, and the work of adaptive leadership very much comes from the natural sciences. Adaptive leadership is really just a framework for leading, and I'll very briefly introduce the framework in a little bit. It was developed by Ronald Heifetz, who wrote um, books like Leadership with No Easy Answers, Leadership on the Line, and um, he developed a framework for leading that uh, looked the natural sciences, um, whether it's a pack of lions, um, a, tr a troop of chimpanzees, or a an ant colony, and looked at the relationship systems, how people came in and out of the colonies um, or the system, about how they handled threats, how they um, really moved into uh, ad adaptation on their own, and how resilient uh, they have become over time. And I think through the natural systems lens, that really has always resonated with me um, because as humans, we're a natural system too. Our workplace is a natural system. And so looking at leadership through the lens of natural systems is kind of a, a different way to think about leadership. And I do think that leadership is more than just inspiration, although it's really great <laughs> when you can inspire people. But it's really hard work. So you see our leaders on this slide um, perspiring, as they should, because this country has a lot of issues to tackle. But you also see Shirley and Kathy smiling and happy on this. Um, but I'm sure if you had a chance to sit down with them with a cup of coffee or a beer, they would tell you um, it hasn't always been about inspiration. There's been a lot of hard, um, a hard work uh, and a lot of perspiring. So I like to think about leadership not so much as um, people, and going back to the, the natural sciences, it's not so much about a person. It's definitely not about a set of characteristics. Um, it's very hard to kind of walk around and say, am I remembering to do this or to be that? I think that it's important to reflect on how well you did in a particular challenging event. But in general, I see leadership as uh, more of a verb, uh, more of an activity, a process that occurs between uh, people, that leadership happening in relationships. So it's a little bit different to think of. And you hear oftentimes people uh, talking about leadership will say that we're all leaders. We can lead from any seat. And I absolutely believe that. I've changed my language a bit, primarily from studying um, adaptive leadership, where the adaptive leadership talks about exercising leadership, and that we all have the capacity and the obligation, the responsibility to exercise leadership. And that really, when we think about this term leader, we've almost done a disservice to it over time because when you hear the word leader, you think of Larry, he's the leader. <laughs> you think of people in positions that hold leader titles. And so that's um, wrong, that's absolutely correct. But I'd like to think really of leadership uh, a little bit differently. 
The other thing in adaptive systems, um, a natural system like the, the lions, etc., when um, they're adapting, they lose part of their DNA. So I think what studying adaptive leadership has done for me is really appreciate what happens in human systems when they adapt. Because we don't lose DNA, but we have to change. So we have to give something up. Um, and adaptive leadership is typically so difficult because its um, values are, beliefs and values are, are very sacred to us. Um, and when we have to adapt, we have to really take a, examine those beliefs and values. So you think about AHIMA right now and the big discussion around education and curriculum updates and um, certification. These are very, very difficult conversations, but really important ones to have. And many will say, uh, I don't know if Marita um, would say this, but I think she might, you know, it's taking too long and it's, we should have done much of the change in uh, HIM curriculum long time ago. And Shirley's shaking her head. And I think Linda Kloss was here. She'd probably say we should have done it in the 80s. <laughs> um, and so we're, we're really kind of running to catch up, but it's hard because we have to give, people have to give something up. Um, and to me, I think about it then as, well, a lot of times you'll hear physicians are very resistant to ICD-10 or they're very resistant to the HR. It's not so much that they're resistant. I, I think they appreciate that we have to have change, but they're going to lose something and we don't always do such a good job um, to address the loss. So I think that we have to learn how to honor history a little bit. Um, we have to be really careful when we go into new jobs, not to throw the baby out with the bathwater because of our excitement. Uh, I certainly, we don't have time, but there's certainly numerous examples that I have on um, either when I've done that or when others have done that or even at the AHIMA level when that's happened and the pain that causes the system. So it's just important as you all go into new jobs um, that you're really good observers of the system that you're stepping into and that you understand some of the values. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Let me talk a little bit about um, the difference between technical and adaptive problems because you can hear me calling, talking about adaptive challenges. Technical problems are things that are very easily defined. Um, you broke your leg, you go to the doctor, he fixes it. You, uh, or it could be more complex, you have to have a leaky valve placed, replaced in your heart. Fortunately, your cardiac surgeon knows how to do that, and he does that. So a technical problem has a, a known um, scope and a known solution. Where an adaptive challenge has no uh, solution. It's something we've never seen before, never experienced before. It requires a totally different approach to solving the problem. And I think as I um, look back at how we've been uh, addressing ICD-10, for example, we have absolutely been approaching it as a, a known problem, a problem that we can solve technically. We can train you know, physicians and everyone else. It's just a simple matter of training people on a new coding system. But the fact with um, adaptive challenges is that there's a lot of stakeholders involved, so it's just not that simple. And there's typically value statements involved. So you hear the AMA, for example, putting up objections, and you know, rightfully so, in their minds, because they feel like they're going to have to give up something to now learn all of these um, supposed codes. So I think just understanding sometimes, am I faced with a technical challenge? Because if I am, then you can apply try and two true techniques. But if I'm faced with an adaptive challenge, it requires uh, something else. And I'll share with you how we go about what that means. What, are, what is that something else that you can apply for adaptive challenges? I want to first um, talk about distinguishing leadership from authority because it's very, very important. And it's not something that really resonated with me when I first heard it a couple years ago. Um, I'm kind of embarrassed to say it took me a little while to understand um, the differences. But now it's very crystal clear for me. When you are um, in authority, I think that oftentimes it really has nothing to do with leadership just because you're in an authority position. Think about a time when you might have said, the leadership is not leading. 
with the exclusion, of course, of Larry, because no one would ever say that <laughs> about you. <laughs> we know that you're always exercising leadership as well as your formal authority. But authority is really the position or the title that you hold. And it's very important authority, of course, to think of our family, to think of the workplace, because authority provides some direction, some protection. It provides order. So that's very, very important. But just because um, people are in authority doesn't mean they're exercising leadership. And I think um, what's important to know is those people in authority have tremendous responsibility to also exercise leadership. And in fact, I think, uh, I don't think it's a picnic. I think that it's uh, very difficult to be in authority position because people have so many expectations. So we go back to the technical problem. People will be looking to the HIM um, expert in the organization to solve ICD-10. That's all well and good, but if we take a very technical approach to that, and not one that's more in keeping with change management, it's going to be a, a, quite a challenge. So people look to you, you're in an authoritative position, but exercising leadership in an authoritative position can actually be very, very difficult. Informal authority, like leadership, can come from anywhere. And sometimes, um, Larry will probably tell you, you can get more done through informal authority than you can in formal authority when it comes to adaptive cha challenges. Because adaptive challenges really um, uh, challenge people's values, etc. There's also the difference between management and leadership, which I think probably you all know. I'm sure you've learned this in your, in your um, programs, so I won't go into it. But it is an important distinction, simply because those HIM professionals who graduated around the time I did were taught to be really, really good managers. So adding leadership and exercising leadership really looks different than managing. Some of your poster presentations were really heavy on management. And that's all well and good, but that may put you down a path where you're, um, you're solving problems in a more technical way. So let me go ahead and get on to the adaptive leadership process so that you can put this a little bit more into context because I haven't really given you um, enough yet to appreciate, well, what does adaptive leadership even look like? The framework is really simple. Uh, it's just an iterative process of observing of interpreting what you're seeing, and then intervening. So it's all common sense. But we don't really take the time to do this very often. Um, for some of you, it might have now become very intuitive, especially as we have a lot of trial and error in our, in our work life. But for observing, it's spending the time in meeting, let's say it's a meet, you're in a meeting, and really trying to understand what's going on in the meeting. What am I seeing? What are the themes that are emerging? What are the behaviors of people? What am I doing? How am I in this meeting? How am I um, representing issues? And it would, it's very helpful when you're observing to suspend judgment, kind of like a scientist does, and to just take notes. Um, collect what you're seeing. And HIM professionals are perfect for this, in particular coders, because that's what they have to do day in and day out. They have to read this, the patient's story. They have to collect the data in the most objective way possible, not reading anything into it. Um, and if there's a suspicion that there's something perhaps missing, well, then they query the physician. But in general, coding professionals and others are really good at remaining objective. So being able to observe uh, with objectivity is really hard because it's very quick to be judgmental. Uh, so doing that observation work. And Ron Heifetz, um, the Harvard School of Kennedy, who has developed this framework, has um, recommendations to go up to the balcony. And actually, if we could be viewers, some of you were moving. If I asked Amy to move up to the balcony, you'd have a totally different view of what was happening down here. Um, so being able to go to the balcony and you know, observe, even using yourself as a data point, Again, how am I, what's my role? What role can I play in the meeting is really important to try to practice those skills, um, whether it's real time in a meeting or simply afterwards, perhaps talking with colleagues who are, who are struggling with how do I tackle a particular problem, spending the time observing. 
the adaptive leadership um, book um, called The Art and Practice of, of or Adaptive Leadership does provide you with a lot of um, ideas for how you can hone your observation skills. But if you're getting into very complex work that doesn't have a solution, um, beginning to really sharpen your observation skills will be important. The next is to interpret. And again, we're putting your scientist hat on. Uh, many times we'll rush to interpret things in one or two ways through our world view. And sometimes it's because we're pressured. We don't have a lot of time. So spending the time creating many hypotheses for what you might be observing will be really critical in your adaptive work. Because you have to see the world through other people's eyes. Otherwise, how the heck will you convince them that your ideas are better? And of course, you may find along the road that your ideas aren't any better. Um, the other thing that's really interesting about interpretations is just trying to hold uh, several interpretations in your head at the same time. Um, and so, you know, trying to, let's say I came to the, to the um, stage late. Larry introduced me and I wasn't here. Well, you might think, well, boy, she doesn't manage time well. Or you might think that I don't care. Or you might think I'm in the bathroom throwing up because I'm nervous. <laughs> Surely we'll <laughs> wonder, what is she doing? Um, you might have all these different hypotheses uh, in your head. So that's a, a silly example. But I think it's really important um, to have different hypotheses, to hold, to kind of suspend your judgment, have different hypotheses, and to kind of play them out. Uh, because it really is going to inform your actions in a way that if you had just gone to one or two interpretations, um, uh, it's going to be much more robust. The other thing is to find a confidant that you can talk to about your interpretations. When you say things out loud, they do sound a little different. Um, I always say pick your confidants uh, very carefully uh, because a lot of the information is sensitive. And then finally, intervene or just or act. So you've taken the time to figure out what's going on in the room. You've gone to the balcony to look down um, to see from a different perspective. Maybe you can't go up to the balcony physically, but you can move your chair back. You can stand up. Um, just really change your position and try to see uh, uh, from a different perspective. And when I'm intervening, what I mean by that, it could be as simple as the next time you go to a meeting and um, Kathy has gone meeting after meeting and she's not said anything, well, maybe this meeting you might ask Kathy for her opinion. <laughs> Or you might, in, I mean, so interventions don't have to be these uh, very big complex things. They can be really simple things that you observed when you were on the balcony about behaviors and patterns of the community or the meeting um, that you're a part of. And just try lots of different experiments. Again, the, the um, adaptive leadership work provides you with some ideas for intervening, um, which you might find helpful. The other way I look at leadership, I mentioned earlier, is as a relationship process. Um, the co my colleague, Leslie Fox, who owns the company that I um, have the joy of working in, um, owned, uh, started the company 37 years ago and began her own journey studying uh, Bowen theory, which is also based on um, natural systems and as a study of human behavior used by social workers, um, psychologists, psychiatrists, consultants, uh, and the like. And that um, Bowen theory, uh, what's so unique and so exciting about uh, that theory is that it looks at uh, organizations, natural systems, uh, um, as an emotional process. And you know what that means when I tell you it's the people issues. And there aren't many theories that really try to understand the people issues and the patterns of behaviors and what they mean. Um, and so this, um, the Bowen theory body of work uh, is, is very, very useful, I think, to navigate those emotional landmines. And I'll speak to that in just a, in a moment. Both adaptive leadership and uh, Bowen theory take a systems perspective. I think it's easy for us to say we are systems thinker, we, we do um, think in systems, and I suspect many of you do. Uh, I know in my early career, I definitely didn't. You know, it was, boy, if um, Amy could just stop doing that, the world would be a lot better. <laughs> 
you know, we kind of grow up in a very other-focused um, world. And um, when you start to study things like uh, complex systems theory or, or Peter Senge systems thinking, etc., you do start to see the world a little bit differently. And I know some of you are reading Peter Block's book on community. Well, that's all about seeing the world through a, a systems lens. So when you're stuck in individual thinking, you really have a significantly narrow perspective. It's going to be very hard for you to get to the balcony. Um, and you're thinking cause and effect because that's how we were taught. You know, if this happens, then that will happen. And it's just not that simple because of all the interdependencies that we have in our community network. Think of your own family. You don't have to look very far for um, examples of behaviors that don't really make a lot of sense um, and that we're all very connected. We all respond um, in relation to the other. I think when you're thinking systems, you just have more choices. You don't really hear either or. Uh, in fact, when I hear people doing either or statements, um, that's a, a, a sign or a symptom to me that there's probably a lot of anxiety or, or narrow thinking in the system. And you can see um, the rest. A little bit about anxiety, because it is part of adaptive leadership and more so with Bowen theory. Um, with Bowen theory, it's a very pivotal uh, concept in that uh, um, our ability to manage our own anxiety is very important in the workplace. It's certainly very important in our families as well. Um, when groups have difficulty managing anxiety, uh, we can see the functioning going down. We can see perhaps um, cliques forming, blaming. We can see absenteeism. We can see more mistakes being made. These are often signs of um, an environment that is um, either highly anxious because of natural turnover, let's say, or maybe because Larry is turning on the heat and he's challenging some of his uh, deans to think differently. And so people are in a little bit of a state of disequilibrium. And as a um, person in an authority position, really monitoring and measuring uh, where the heat is in the room, how, how high um, can I turn the heat up on individuals before, um, so I don't reach that zone where people stop being productive is really a, a difficult skill because you have to challenge people. Um, the only way we can adapt is if we change something and to change something um, you're t typically being challenged. So I just wanted to really pause um, and share with you a little bit about anxiety only because I think that you can make profound changes in your work by simply reflecting on what do you react to. What are your trigger points? And how does that play out in the system that, that you function in? And then just look at, at the level of anxiety in a system. Look for those things um, such as uh, people coming together in cliques, because that's how we bind anxiety. The term binding anxiety is just a way for us to manage our anxiety. You'll see that typically it can happen through conflict, or people um, have a lot of togetherness. Funerals, for example, are a really good example of people coming together to bind anxiety. I think, too, I wanted to mention, when you're making your interpretations, um, I think it's really important to be gentle, because we're all uh, just trying to do the best that we can every day. And I think sometimes we can be very um, tough on each other. And I think your ability to be a little more objective. We don't really know what's going on with individuals, um, and individuals are often responding to the system that they work in. Uh, so I, I just, again, as you try to practice systems, when you really get to a point where you're practicing systems, I believe you'll get to a point where you're really not blaming a certain individual um, for the way things are. I think it's very, been very easy in healthcare to blame the physicians, for example, um, and I think that that's unfair because it's a, it's a much more complex process. Okay, uh, the last couple of comments I want to make are around your own uh, self-development. I just spoke a little bit about the triggers. Know what gets you excited and angry or frustrated, um, and just observe yourself. See how that um, 
how effective your interventions are when you're in an anxious state or when you're in a calmer state or et cetera. Look at your own family to play that out because if you can figure it out in your own family, because we learn our patterns of, of behavior, um, what things push our buttons, come from the, our family patterns. And we bring those into the workplace. So if you can really study um, the patterns in the family, I think you'll have some great insights onto your own functioning in the workplace. Um, know also your loyalties, because as we're leading adaptive change, uh, really difficult change like EHR implementations, implementing information governance frameworks, which is a little hard to get senior leaders um, uh, excited about and get off the dime. You have to understand where people's blind spots are. Because if you're going to do something um, that is contrary to what someone expects of you, who you've traditionally been very loyal to, they're going to see you as disloyal. And so that can be difficult sometimes. So where are your loyalties? Um, you know, if, when you have to make a tough decision and you end up compromising, did you compromise because of a loyalty? Uh, so it's, a, it's just an interesting other thing that hangs out there that I know I, I never really quite looked at. Knowing your values at this point in life, you should be really clear on what's important to you and what your values are. Because leadership, as Marita writes in her book, it's about who you are. It's really not this magic silver bullet. It's the belief in yourself, it's your self-esteem, um, and certainly it's your wisdom and, the, and your skills. Your, your leadership toolkit is very important. You, uh, I think it's important to get leadership training, which I'll differentiate from development, because development is developing self in this case, and training is getting those negotiation skills, problem solving, presentation, whatever they might be, adaptive leadership process. I mean, that's for all intents and purposes a toolkit. And then just knowing your purpose. Also, it's important to take time for reflection. And Marita, you did such a nice job in your book on reflection. And we don't do this enough. Life does not give us the time and space uh, to reflect uh, as often as we should. Uh, about our strengths and where we want to take them, what more can we do. Uh, I, I'm not suggesting that you not focus on weaknesses, but I personally don't because that can be really frustrating. <laughs> I want to just work on the things um, that I'm already really good at. Um, now, having said that, when it comes to managing relationships or managing anxiety, that is a lifelong journey and any weaknesses there, I certainly um, do work on personally. But I think reflection is important because that's how you get to know yourself better and that's how you can get more comfortable in your own skin. You have the content knowledge, um, but it's not going to be enough for you. You're not, I think I talked to a couple people who said, well, you know, I've brought this concept at the poster presentation. I brought this concept to my employer one time, second time, the third time, and I think maybe now they're hearing me. You have to be persistent, but you have to have a lot of courage and will to kind of keep at it. And so I think the reflection is just really important. And I hope that you, most of you will recognize this picture. And those of you that don't, you'll have to go out and visit um, Duluth to, to know it. All right, I want to just stop and show you a three-minute video. Um, it's a wonderful video about albatrosses learning how to fly. And you might think that's kind of a strange uh, analogy that I'm going to show you, albatrosses. They have a bad rap. Albatrosses really um, uh, were and are a lucky bird because you very rarely saw them when you were, if you were a mariner out at sea. Uh, when you saw these birds, it would mean good luck. However, um, if you shot one of these birds, it would mean bad luck, and the person who shot it usually had to wear the albatross around its neck. But I love watching the albatrosses learn to fly because, to me, it really exemplifies what leadership looks like. When the albatrosses first start, you'll see they're very timid. Um, they kind of go up to the edge of the water, and then they turn around, and then they try again, and they're really awkward. <laughs> um, and so this is what the experience of leadership will be for you. There'll be times where you feel terribly incompetent, there'll be times when you're scared to death and you're going to run the other way. So let me let the albatrosses show you um, what I think leadership looks like. And oops, but not that way. Hold on just a second. 
There we go. Each summer, on tiny Midway Atoll, young Laysan and black-footed albatrosses are abandoned by their parents. It's time to learn to fly. The young birds are at that awkward teenage stage, with hairdos to match. Instinct and an empty stomach draw them out to the beach, where they see the sea for the first time, and test their wings. The first walk to the water's edge can be uncertain, and some turn back to think it over, and practice a little more. Thousands of birds come to the sea's edge, ready to try. Maybe. When they enter the water, they often take a drink, their first taste of the sea. Some float out over the waves. Others run. Once they're in, they often drift a while, wings up, and run in again, not ready. But soon, they're running across the surface of the sea, trying to fly. Franz crouched among the birds to photograph them. Just inside the outer reef, the birds took to the air. And outside, on the open sea, adults flew with the grace the young birds will soon have. Okay, my back? Good. I love this video. I just think that, uh, and maybe it's more of a personal thing for me, but that's how my leadership experience has been. And I think that's when you know that you're exercising leadership because it's not easy and it's awkward. Um, and it can be. Uh, it can be such a joy, though. And when you do master um, exercising leadership, which is really a lifelong journey. And even once you're a master at it, you'll still struggle. <laughs> um, it's just part of life and it's normal. A couple of things I want to leave you with that um, we have a laboratory in life to practice leadership each and every day. And so I think that it's so important to take advantage of that, whether it's at home or in your community, um, wherever it might be. I think it's important to have colleagues that can help you like I had with Kathy and Shirley, with Marita and Margaret. They're always there for me, in particular the, the two of you, because we went through a lot together um, when I was first learning to fly myself. Um, so I think it's important to not go it alone, to find the people who will be there, and to never, never, ever be embarrassed to ask for help. It's so important to ask for help. And if you're in a safe community, that really shouldn't be a problem. I think it's important to manage your anxiety, to really understand what makes you anxious and how that plays out in everything that you do. Uh, and how does it hinder you? How does it help you? Certainly uh, a, an amount, a small amount of stress is very important. I mean, I think that's, <laughs> we're alive and we get our adrenaline going. Um, understand when you're working with a problem that has a known solution versus a problem that doesn't have uh, a known solution because they're totally different approaches. We can't approach an ICD-10 implementation as if we're just teaching the country a new coding um, 
classification system. It's so much more than that. And the promise of ICD-10 is so much more than that. And then resisting um, to jump to action. We live in such a fast world where everybody wants uh, a quick fix. And it's important to just slow down and take the time to observe and, and to interpret, to just think. <laughs> to just give you that time and space to think. And especially in an adaptive change, you have to. You can't just you know, be on autopilot. Which is um, the issue with anxiety, by the way, that I failed to mention. So much of the behaviors and patterns that you might see are people just on autopilot. Again, it's just how we've come to survive um, through the years. I think it's important, too, to just have your own internal motto, um, something that can help you. I'm a swimmer. That's me in the green cap. I do um, I swim triathlons and other open water swims. And so for me, uh, it's been two things. It's been just keep swimming. So when I really just want to stop, I have to have that inner voice that says just keep swimming, just keep swimming. And I've learned tons from my swimming background, in particular the importance of practice, uh, which of course you saw with the albatrosses and hopefully you got that message from me um, already about this laboratory. So just get out there and practice. Get out and do lots of little experiments. The other mantra that I have uh, that's important to me is that I always um, and think before anything important, something like this is important to me. I'll always say everything um, I need is inside of me. So I don't know what it is for you, but what's your affirmation? What's something that's going to lift you up in a tough situation? It's important to have. It goes back to that self-development and about leadership. I think we were all thinking that leadership is... Um, kind of a mystery and again a way of being or a set of skills or you're, you're born with it but it's really none of that it's being humble it's being available to your own emotions uh, and I think it's just being willing to um, form good relationships and take some risks I love what's on your Facebook page, the Keep Calm and Carry On. Of course, I would love that because I think being able to be a calm presence is really important. We didn't really talk about that leadership behavior, but when you're exercising leadership, being fully present um, and being calm, I think will help you at least think uh, and not shut down. And so we've got a lot of maybe, I don't know if it's pressure, but a lot of responsibility to continue to carry on. Um, and we know that Shirley and Kathy are lifting us up. Um, they're expecting great things from us. But like they've done through their whole entire career, they have challenged us in the kindest way possible, but still in a way that helps us elevate our functioning. And then we have Grace Whiting Myers, who <laughs> founded um, at least AHIMA and certainly was very important in creating the profession. And she created the profession um, for, t for many reasons, but for two that really resonate with me. The first was so that we have standards at that time for hospital records. Of course, now our goal is to have standards that um, preserve, that capture and preserve the patient's story no matter where anyone's treated. And the second is that she really had a big dream that health information management or medical record science would be valued just as much as any other science. And we're still on that journey, which is terribly frustrating. <laughs> um, but we're still on that journey to make HIM, or health informatics and information management, a science that is just as valued as other sciences. So leave it now back to you to, to keep calm and carry on. And I'll just say my final comments is that if you can exercise leadership 2% more than you did yesterday, <laughs> Um, or 10% more, 50% more, the world will be, and I know this sounds Pollyanna, but it will be a better place if you put yourself out there a little bit more. You've got the content stuff. I'm not worried about that. But do you have the, the grounding of who you are, your values, um, your ability to have kind of manage um, a landmine of people's reactivities to the kinds of change that you might like to do. Can you handle anger gracefully, for example? 
So um, as you leave here today, just um, think about that gap again and what kinds of things you can do to move towards that. And take good care of yourself. It's important um, in this leadership journey to be a whole person. So thank you so very much, Ryan. Thank you for reaching out to me and asking me to come share my leadership ideas with you. And just have a wonderful week, those of you who are here for the week. It's an immersion, it sounds like. And Kathy and Shirley, thank you very much again. And just bless you guys. <laughs> so thank you. So much. It's beautiful. In honor of April 63rd, uh, please accept this call to St. Scholastica sweatshirt as a token of our appreciation. I love it. <laughs> oh, it's beautiful. Let me show you all. Thank you so much. Oh my gosh, Ryan. And I want to show everybody. You know, women like to do that. Honey, look what I got at the store. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ryan. Well, that was fantastic. Thank you so much, Patty. Um, I think that's what the entire point of this Latour Eichenwald Forum is really about, is to bring people together and talk about uh, different ideas around the concept of leadership and innovation. And uh, I think what I've taken away from that is that, you know, again, leadership is really a balance. And I think uh, your talk has provided uh, great tools and inspiration um, that can help uh, practicing professionals and our students who are here today and are online, uh, you know, succeed in the industry and in life. So thank you again. And uh, thanks to all of you who uh, attended, uh, both in person and online. Um, I just would like to say, uh, be on the lookout for the Save the Date for next year. We'll have another event, um, the third annual, and hopefully it will be as, as, as wonderful as this one was. So again, thank you all.